What would you go into exile for? What would make you pack up and leave your homeland and move to a distant and alien place and start over? To flee war, persecution, bloodshed? Maybe even you committed a horrendous crime and you need to escape punishment. Oh, there's all sorts of reasons to flee into exile. The benefit that the ancient world had over today, well, there's plenty of them, but one that stands out is there were places to go. Even up until the United States had finished settling the western frontier, you could go to America. Whatever you were running from, fleeing from, you wanted the freedom to think new thoughts, to write and teach new thoughts, all the way down to you were wanted for deserting from the Kaiser's army in 1865 because you didn't want to fight the French, my ancestor, and you might end up in the United States. There were places to go, places to run to, places to flee to, but now the planet is settled. Alas, we don't have any colonies on Mars that you can easily run off to, and we have a satellite system that means there's no escape. Now I bring this up because the Bible is full of these stories, and it's interesting how the funnel, the funnel narrows, the funnel widens. The United States became, for a time in its history, the place where all the European powers and the various religions and cultures of Europe, at least, funneled in, and there was an Italian neighborhood, and a German neighborhood, and an Irish neighborhood, but eventually they funneled in together whatever it was that was driving them away, whatever it was that made them flee, the hope, the dream of something better, the fear of something behind, whatever it was. When we're talking about the first century and the persecution following the martyrdom of Stephen, people are scattering around the world from the Holy Land because they're afraid. They want the freedom to think new thoughts, to teach, write, preach new things, to believe, or rather, believe the fulfillment of all of those old things in what we call the Old Testament. The promise of Christ all the way back to the Garden of Eden, a descendant of a woman will crush the serpent's head. It has happened. Jesus has come into the world. He has proven himself by signs and miracles, by healing, even reanimating the dead. Moreover, he has died for the sins of the world and risen again. This is an inconvenient truth for the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Zealots, even the Romans in time will see it as a threat. But here at the beginning, the persecution of the church by the Sanhedrin, by the Jewish council, even murdering St. Stephen, the proto-martyr, this is reason to get out of town. If you go to Antioch or Ephesus, go to Byzantium, even all the way to Rome, Nobody's heard of Christianity. It isn't even called Christianity until Antioch. Nobody knows what it is that you believe, teach, and confess. You can go there and you can share it with them in a setting where it is not yet considered threatening. The Hebrew people, on the other hand, have a whole weird way that they did this funnel. God brought Abraham out of Ur, he brings him out of a large, thriving population, and he sets him up as a settler somewhere new. He allows the population of the descendants of Abraham to grow. In time, they become a whole nation worth of people, but living in captivity in the nation of Egypt. God brings them out and funnels them into the Holy Land, to this place where Abraham and they had lived, their ancestors had lived. God brings them back. They build one temple, they have one tent of meeting, they have one capital, they have one place to go and face towards for prayer, they have one place to enter into for the liturgy, the sacrifices, the rituals. In a weird sense, the Hebrew people that go and live around the world after that, well, they're leaving home. It's like graduating high school today or in the last 50 years, 100 years, and you go off to college, 
and your home church isn't there, the pastor you grew up with isn't there, and you're living someplace completely strange right in the borders of your own country. But in a setting where there's one temple, one priesthood, one capital for the whole nation, going away to Rome or Greece or Egypt for school, for study, for business, anything that drives people away, it pulls them away from the actual covenant relationship with God Almighty that is in hearth and home. It's like going off to college and losing your faith and going wild and partying and your family bemoans that they lost you to the outside world. There's any number of reasons people would move and we find settlements all the way to Spain. But when you leave your people in that old covenant situation, then where is your temple? Where is your, where is your liturgy? Where are your people? You can face that direction and pray from a half a world away more than that by the ancient map, but you're separated from your people, your customs, your heritage. People tended to leave back then because they were losing their faith or their faith didn't matter to them. Because it was more important to move to Rome and open a shop and make money than it was to be here. It was better to go all the way to Spain where you could get that easy access to merchandise that you were shipping back home to make that money. You left home for a lot of the wrong reasons back then, and you see, this is what's so fascinating about these exiles in the Bible. God brings the people all together in one place, and because of their sin, they begin to separate. Because of their sin and war and division and conquest, because God not protecting them, because they rebel against God, the conquest by the Babylonians, War and bloodshed drives people away, most shockingly because of the Babylonian captivity, the rise of a false religion that becomes Phariseeism, what we today call Judaism, with the birth of the synagogue, a rabbi, a completely new religion not found in the Old Testament law given by God to the Israelites. They can then move anywhere in the world and build a synagogue and carry on their community, separated from the land God promised, the things that he commanded, the one temple gone that God told them to build, and they can go through this play acting of a false religion, kind of sort of a little bit derived from God's word a very long time ago. And so turning their back on the truth makes it all that easier to leave home, go wild, do whatever the world is doing. But when it comes to the first century and the beginnings of the persecution, A, that there's a famine, B, that there's the murder of the martyrs, people begin to move around. People have to move around. This group of over 500 witnesses who saw the risen Jesus before he ascended into heaven, who are sent out to share that message with the world, these 12 apostles, 11 remaining until God, Jesus himself, chooses Paul. These 12 apostles whose job it is is to spread this to the ends of the earth. When the persecution comes, much to their own chagrin, the people that are persecuting the church, hoping to stamp it out, cause it to go everywhere. Like trying to squash out a grease fire and a splatter, and lo and behold, where has it gone? Believing that they could silence the church by murdering men like James and Stephen, seeing that the murder of James pleased the Pharisees and the Sadducees, stepping up the number of murders and arrests, and yet more and more as you tighten your grip, things slip away. The grease splatters. The Christians begin to move out to other communities all over the Mediterranean, and Christianity will go with them. And because they are driven out, accompanying that ministry that is laid down by Christ to the apostles, the word of God will be spread throughout the world. And it's the word of God that says, come back together. Again, the funnel. The word of God that says, come home. The wedding feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end, is here. But it's no longer a come home, 
in the same sense as it was for Abraham's descendants. It's not returned from Babylon, not returned from Nineveh, which they didn't do. It's not gather back from the places you've been living and come to the Holy Land and build a temple and do these Old Testament rituals. Rather now, it is the church of Jesus Christ, which is the one church, the one temple, the one liturgy, the one faith, the one creed, but reaching into this universe in all times and places where the word of Jesus is preached, taught, confessed, and practiced. Now you can go to Spain, you can go to Rome, you can go to Ireland, you can go to all the places where the missionaries will go over centuries, and you're still home where you're preaching the one faith, the one church, the one creed, the one confession of the one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We humans have any number of reasons to scatter and gather back together. But God keeps repeating this pattern of saying unity, togetherness, one holy Christian church, one holy Israelite temple, one spiritually, metaphysically, across all times and spaces. But now the wedding feast of the Lamb has come. He has atoned for the sins of the world and risen triumphantly from the tomb. Now we have the sacraments, the word. We have his very body and blood. We have the blood of his baptismal regeneration. The church is bequeathed and empowered in all times and places with this one doctrine, one faith, one baptism, one supper, one word of the Lord God Almighty that is bringing us back wherever we are geographically in the world doesn't matter. God scooping us up and bringing us to the feast. And the ones invited earlier than you or me, the ones invited first, the ones who refused to come back, the ones who left for whatever reason of the world, of prophet, false doctrine, and false religion, he says they will never taste my banquet. Rather, those that have been called to him by the power of the Spirit, the ones that weren't invited, the ones that didn't know until later, the ones who were crippled and lame and blind, the ones who cannot find him, know him, seek him, and cannot live by his word because we are lost and dead sinners. He comes to us through the preaching of his gospel. He regenerates us. He converts. He redeems. He sanctifies. He draws us to himself, and he makes us whole. And even those who are stubborn, because we are, the stubborn, miserable, thick-headed sinners like the Israelites before us, God says to the army of light, to the angels and archangels, the whole company of heaven, to the Holy Ghost in particular, go out and compel them to come in. Round them up and bring them here to that which they would not choose, they would not endeavor for, work for, walk to, take a boat to, fly to, what we would not will, what we would not work for or pay for, but to drag us, kicking and screaming against our own sin and our own stubbornness, to wash us, redeem us, make us new, feed us, house us, clothe us with robes radiant, with the purification of, from all of our sin, to make all things new. Our real exile in life isn't in the Roman Empire, it isn't in Antioch, it isn't even in the old American West. Our exile is being sinners in a sinful world. But as Jesus' word converts us to saints, he is gathering us out of this exile, bringing us home to something made new, made perfect, restored eternally in eternal bliss and perfection with no exile, only home. In Jesus' name, amen.